Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a great pair of guests with a really, really good book that I'm really looking forward to digging into. Since the beginning of the forum, since our very first month, way back in 2016, we have been focused on campus economics. How do we fund higher education? What does student debt mean right now? How do we support different kinds of labor on campus? What does public support mean? How is that changing? We've been covering this from multiple areas for month after month, year after year. And now we have some of the best people in the world to speak to about this. Um, Sandy Baum and Michael McPherson are longstanding economists with long, brilliant careers in higher education, including not just being published uh, scholars, not just being great teachers, but also leading uh, campuses, including colleges and universities. They are the author of a new book, Campus Economics, and I cannot recommend this book highly enough. In fact, we have a link to it in the bottom left corner of our screen. Uh, the first half of the book is the cleanest, most elegant, most up-to-date summary of how campus economics work. Uh, it's just fantastic. It's 75 pages or so, and it just sets the stage perfectly. The second half of the book looks at some of the biggest challenges, some of the biggest, most controversial questions around how we finance higher education. And that's why I'd like to have them both here. So let me quickly clear the stage. Let me bring them up so that we can see both of them. And then we can start our conversation. Well, greetings, Drs. McPherson and Baum. Hi. Hi. Thank you for those very generous comments about our book. Well, I mean every word of them. Uh, it is really, really powerful and a delight. And it's great to see both of you. Are you you're coming to us from uh, Maryland? We're in Bethesda, Maryland right now, yes. Okay. So there's always a very, very nerdy aspect to Bethesda, which is that it is the home of one of the world's most influential and successful computer game manufacturers with the name of Bethesda Software. So if you, if you haven't seen that, you should check them out. They're amazing. Um, but it's definitely an interesting case of a very local successful business. Um, but I, I'm so glad you could join us today. Uh, let, me, let me just quickly ask. We have a, a unique way of people introducing themselves on the forum, which is we ask people to describe what they're working on right now and what they're working on for the next year. So, you know, what are the, what are the big projects? What are the big, uh, you know, in economic terms, what services are you providing? But also, what, uh, what topics are you focusing on for the next year? Well, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about a, a lot of issues relating to higher education finance. Let me just say we're not in the process of writing another book. We had two books oh. come out, and that was enough for now. Oh. Um, we do hope, however, to... Um, you know, pursue the ideas in this book. We're happy to talk to people on their campuses to engage in conversations about the issues. So we, we don't feel done with this book. Let me say that. But um, but there always are, of course, important issues arising relating to student debt, relating to other financial aid issues, to racial equity on campuses and, and the funding of higher education. So, um, you know, I continue to work on all of those issues. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And Dr. McPherson. Yeah, well, right now I'm working on learning how to play Here Comes the Sun. Um, you want to know what we were working on right now. And it's, Well, you have to tell me what instruments. Uh, guitar. Acoustic? Acoustic, yeah. Very good. Uh, Very good. I'm one of those, you know, old people who has guitars that are much nicer than he deserves to have. <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, in, in coming closer to the work that uh, we're talking about today, uh, I kind of recently recognized that all the stuff that, that I learned about in my youth in this field uh, is now history. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. things, things that used to be current become history. Mm -hmm. So... I'm thinking about doing several essays on, uh, that are kind of located in the history of economic thought uh, about the origins of the contemporary concept of human capital, mm. you know, the history of uh, famous 
uh, Baumol and Bowen cost disease, mm -hmm. and what implications that has, and uh, things of that sort. Uh, so it's a, I'm not trained as a historian, uh, but it's, uh, it's an interesting new adventure for me. And I think, unlike some fields, I mean, maybe, maybe in physics, though this is probably wrong too, but maybe in physics, old issues are just old, just dumb. Mm -hmm. uh, in economics, that's never true. And mm -hmm. there are always insights that you get from reading, you know, a Will Baumol or a, a mm -hmm. Hitchfeld's that uh, are as fresh as they were when they were written. Mm, excellent, excellent. Well, I have to say, just personally, I would love to see um, any work on uh, Baumol's cause disease. Uh, I would love to see that essay. Um, I, I refer to this every week uh, and uh, that concept, and I would love to hear more about it. And, uh, and of course, Sandy, I, I, we all need to hear this kind of work. Uh, we all need this right now because academia is in quite a place. Um, and every topic you've mentioned um, is one that is of great moment. Uh, for us right now. But friends, um, I wanted to ask you about this book. And there are so many questions I, I, I want to ask. But the, the first one I, I, I want to I want to put this to you as delicately as possible, because I know it's it's a political landmine or it's a multifaceted landmine. It can blow up in different directions. Um, you elegantly ask the reader to consider a given college or university as an economic entity, and, it, and you have this great way of putting it, not quite as a business and not quite as a non-economic entity, but something in between. Now, setting aside for-profit higher education for the moment, you know, thinking about uh, private higher education and thinking about um, uh, public higher education, how have you succeeded in talking to people about this in a way that doesn't just make everybody upset? that you don't get people throwing charges of corporatization of the university at you or charges of, you know, dismissing the economic fundamentals of higher education. How, how do you, how do you get people to think about an individual campus in that economic sense? Well, I think, you know, one of the problems is that you frequently have two categories of people. One, the people who are really concerned about the bottom line at the institution, about the financial future of the institution, about efficiency on campus. And they tend to want to speak a language that uses terminology um, coming from business or economics and that focuses on, look, this is what we're worried about. We have to have money. We have to have resources. Everything is fine yet. We have choices. And they tend to you know, they might think of the students as customers. They might think of, um, um, you know, use words like de demand for our services that just turn off people who are whose primary focus is the real educational mission of the institution. And then you have people whose focus is centrally the real educational mission who just think, don't bother me with any kind of resource constraints or financial issues. I would say one of the things that the first time I started thinking about writing something like this, I was in a meeting with faculty and administrators and sitting together, and there were concerns about the budget. And one faculty member said, don't talk to me about money in the same conversation with curriculum. And I thought, oh, so here's, here's the problem. We need to get, I mean, the whole purpose, the reason we're all there is the mission. The reason we're there is not as it is in a for-profit company to make money. Or, to, you know, it, it, that's just not why we're there. We're there for the mission. But obviously carrying out the mission involves resources and resources are finite and there are trade-offs. So I think that what we're really trying to do is get people to have this conversation, to think about their vocabulary, to think about the other people and the different roles that people on campus have and try to understand each other. So, yeah, I guess... Uh, I completely sympathize with that. Uh, one thing I think about is, is uh, my role for seven years as a college president uh, and uh, being in the club of college presidents, you know, who, who like to commiserate with one another about our common terrible fate, uh, for which we are exceedingly well paid, I should say. Uh -huh. uh, but I have the impression of a lot of college leaders 
would actually like to avoid dealing with the the very difficult issues of trade-offs and painful choices about whether you can expand the faculty in one field or another uh, and just let us take care of it. You know, we're the pros. We know how to manage this. Mm. And when things go south, as they will do from time to time, all of a sudden you hear from them, look, folks, we're all in this together. This is going to be mutual sacrifice and all that. And I don't think you can work it that way. I mean, I think you have to either decide you're going to take total responsibility for the place and leave the faculty and the students to themselves, or you're going to have to have a continuing open dialogue. So one of the things that we did at, at McAllister was either I or the provost at each of the monthly faculty meetings would give a little talk about some set of choices that we were facing. Not to bring the news of a decision, but to say, this is on our plates. This is on everybody's plates. Let, let me give you a little insight into what the dimensions of it are. And then we would encourage you to keep the conversation going on campus. It's, I think for us, the most important thing is people have to find a vocabulary where they can talk with one another uh -huh. respectfully and in an informed way. Well, it sounds like you're, that's a great model for it, uh, one that honors both uh, the conversational power of, of higher education, but also faculty governance. Right. Uh, well, that common language is difficult uh, to achieve, but I think your book gives us a really solid vocabulary for it. I, uh, the second question I want to ask, and this is something that I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with, uh, I'm afraid, um, has to do with the, the power of enrollment. Um, I mean, enrollment, uh, there's, a, there's a great Johns Hopkins book on uh, managing small colleges, and uh, one chapter begins with enrollment is code for revenue, um, which I've always, I've always enjoyed. And, and you've pointed out that depending on the institution, uh, enrollment can account for a minority or a majority of revenue, depending on, on the institution, its funding, and so forth. But the question I have is, we've, we've been experiencing... Uh, a steady decline in enrollment for the past decade. Uh, and that's unusual because we enjoyed a generation of steady, indeed rampant growth from the early 80s through 2012. Um, what kind of impact is this gradual decline going to have on higher education as a whole? How are we going to be able to keep funding our teaching and research missions if the number of customers or students or however you want to refer to them is starting to trickle down. So the, uh, it's hard particularly right now to make clear sense of the enrollment numbers because of COVID. Uh, naturally that had a dramatic impact and in one year there was a very large drop in enrollment. And then I think it's easy for people to forget that it takes four or five years for that drop to work itself through the statistics. So uh, one doesn't want to overreact to numbers that are, this has been a problem with inflation too, actually. In uh -huh. uh -huh. inflation. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is in the background, the demographics are changing. The number of 18 year olds in the society is going down after a long period when it went up. And so you have to pay differential attention to uh, enrollment as a share of the population and enrollment just as a raw number. And I think you'd find that a lot of the gradual decline is a result of the decline in cohort size. That still leaves you with a problem, but it's a similar yeah. problem. And then, and then you also have to recognize these huge regional differences, right? The Midwest is losing population to the Southwest and has been for a long time. Yeah. So when you talk about enrollment troubles, they really hit, you know, places like Minnesota, where I used to be. Uh -huh. 
situation in uh, Arizona or in Florida is very different. I think it's also really important not to talk about higher education as so it were monolithic in this conversation. Uh -huh. Different kinds uh -huh. of institutions fare very differently. I mean, much of the enrollment decline is at community colleges and uh, uh -huh. the for-profit sector has certainly shrunk. And that's uh -huh. different from enrollment declines in public and private four-year institutions. Uh -huh. And um, of course, you know, there still is a subset of institutions that are highly selective and they turn away a lot of qualified students and, you know, this is not an issue for them. And so the extent to which an institution is enrollment dependent really matters. And, you know, for community colleges, it's interesting because enrollment has declined, funding per student has increased. So it becomes much more complicated to figure out the pros and cons. And I think the circumstances of each individual institution are going to be very different in terms of the impact of enrollment changes. Oh, this is fascinating. Thank you. Thank you both. Those are terrific answers. Friends, I have so many questions for our guests, but the forum is about all of you to ask your questions. So please, uh, this is a great time. Either if you are um, uh, if, if you want to raise your hand and join us on stage, you can tell that it's clear you don't have to be a beard, have a beard in order to be on stage. Um, but, I'll, but and if you want to just type in your question in the Q&A box, please do that and I'll share it with everybody else. So while people are thinking, while they're cogitating and thinking of questions, um, there are a couple of comments that come up in the chat. And I just want to uh, uh, share those really quickly. Um, we had a, a, a couple of people, uh, Tom Hames and Kiel Dumsch, have asked, how do we know the 1950s and the 60s weren't the blip, um, that that was an unusual spike up, but instead we have something different going on now? Um, Kiel responds, the 1950s through the 90s saw the rise of government policy pushing everyone to go to college, coupled with the adoption of degrees as the required credential for white collar employment, or for white collar employment. I guess based on those comments, I would ask, do you think we still have a political consensus that more and more people should get more and more post-secondary experience? You know, I do. I mean, I think one of the things that that comment <clears throat> highlights that's really important is to talk about a decline without talking about the increase that preceded it. It doesn't really make much sense because if what's happening is a sort of evening out of a positive trend, I mean, that would still involve a decline. Um, but, you know, the everyone should go to college. I do think that for a period of time, we got sort of carried away with everyone should go to college and not much discussion of where they should go or why they should go or what they should do when they're there. And then mm. we started to realize that actually it's not just about access to college. It's about success. And what we really need is to get people through college. And of course, we don't want a 100 percent success rate. We want people to try college if they are interested and have a chance of benefiting. So so we do want more people to go to college. We don't want financial constraints to be the reason people don't go to college. But that doesn't mean uh, and if, that everyone should go to college. And I think there is more realization now of the importance of um, strengthening other pathways to success. Uh -huh. Because some of those pathways are things that we call college. I mean, when you hear people say, yeah, but, you know, maybe you want to be a plumber. Why should you go to college? And you need to say, yeah, but you need to learn how to be a plumber. And you're probably going to do that, you know, maybe at a community college. And that's college. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So part of it is about the definition of college. And I just think that there have been questions about the value of a college education for a long time. And again, you have this problem that you find a few people for whom college didn't work out. And there are absolutely people who are worse off after trying college than they would have been if they hadn't. But that's just not going to be true of most people. But there are always going to be those exceptions. We have to recognize them. We have to stop pretending like this works out for everyone. Mm -hmm. But it's very clear that college is, and, and maybe the, the public discourse ignores this too much, but college isn't just about getting a piece of paper. College is about learning learning to think, not just learning specific subject matter, but learning to solve problems. Um, and that's not going to stop being important. And education is not going to stop being important. And we can't let the conversation be entirely in terms of pieces of paper, specific credentials, or or even earnings. Or even earnings. You, you know, to go back to my... Uh... A newfound interest in history. Uh, back in the 1970s, college actually for a little while didn't pay off well at all. Uh, hmm. Great labor economist Richard Freeman wrote a book called The Overeducated American, 
And it turned out that that downward trend in the earnings gain from higher education was a blip. And it turned around quickly. It had to do partly with with men going to college because they were trying to avoid the draft and Vietnam mm -hmm. era and a number of other technological considerations. Uh, but some of the best writing and thinking about the non-economic reasons for going to college uh, occurred in that era. Uh, hmm. You know, it's easy if you're trying to sell your institution to say, you know, you're going to get rich or you're going to make a million dollars more than if you don't go to college. Right. It's harder to explain to people why, even if that's not true, and I should make clear, it is true. If you complete college, you will make a million dollars more, not discounted in the course of your career. Uh, but you should, there are good reasons why you should come to college anyway. You will become a more discerning thinker. You will have capacities to, to help your community change in constructive ways from what you learned while you were in college. And you will have the joy of learning, which is a very precious thing. So uh, in some ways, we'd be better off if, if college didn't pay off quite as well as it does, because huh. then you would have uh, fewer people looking at college attendance as a meal ticket and more people looking at it as a way of enriching their lives. <clears throat> Thank you for walking us down both paths of the um, military benefits and the non-financial benefits. Um, we have questions, uh, Sandy and Mike, that are just piling up, and I want to make sure people get a chance to ask them. So let me fire off the first one. And this is from uh, our friend Tom Ames, who is smack dab in the middle of the Texas heat dome. So if he expires in the next five minutes, we need to get to his question first. Um, where are we seeing the greatest increase in the cost of colleges? And do these align with tuition rises? And can you explain discrepancies? So I assume that this is a question about where do we see increases in how much it costs to produce education and does tuition follow? And we know that there's a really weak link between the price of producing an education and tuition. If you're looking at public institutions, obviously, the level of appropriations um, of state and, and in some cases local funding for higher education has so much to do with how those costs are covered. Um, and I think, you know, it's really hard to say, again, you know, making these generalizations, we know that institutions are spending more and more on financial aid. Now, do you think of financial aid as an expenditure? Do you think about it as a discount? You never had that money anyway. If you didn't spend it, you wouldn't have your revenues. That depends on the type of institution that you're in. Oh. Um, and different institutions really spend differently. I mean, you look at, you know, for-profit institutions spending on advertising, and there's a surprising amount of advertising among non about among nonprofit institutions as yep. well. Yep. Um, obviously, the biggest expense for colleges and universities is personnel, but it's not that the faculty are getting rich. Um, but it is that it is very expensive to pay all of these people and to pay for their health insurance and so on. So if you ignore those expenses, um, you're never going to find the answer. But, you know, everyone looks at, well, how much are we spending? Is there administrative bloat? I think the administrative bloat, mm -hmm. bloat issue is quite overblown because the number of personnel who are not instructors, the share that really hasn't gone up. It's that instead of having, you know, secretaries, we have technology people and they do get paid more than, than the secretaries did. So that makes the, the budget for those people go up. But again, I think it's looking at every individual institution, certainly differs by sector, but it also differs by region of the country um, and, and a lot by selectivity. Um, so I don't think that tuition increases are in fact um, I mean, they're long over the long run. Yeah, sure, tuition goes up to cover higher expenses, but that connection is rather tenuous, at least in the short term. Ah, that's 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 great to hear. Thank you. Um, and, and Tom, as, 
as always, thank you for the really keen question. Uh, if you're new to the forum, friends, that's an example of a Q&A question. So if you'd like to follow Tom's footsteps and ask one of those, just head to the bottom of the screen, that white strip, click the question mark button and type one in. And here's another one, in fact. Uh, and this is actually a question about a specific aspect of university administration. Um, here, this is from uh, our friend Mark DeFusco who asks, I haven't read the book yet, but I wanted to ask why boards are in many cases honorific or philanthropic rather than fiduciary. Ah. <laughs> Do you want me to bring that back up again? Uh, no, I, I, okay. I get it. So uh, uh, why don't we have more business people running boards? Mm. I guess would be a translation of that question. Mm. Uh, and I think a big part of the answer is they're not businesses. Uh, uh, I was in a wonderful discussion once uh, with Richard Chait, who is yeah. a longtime student of and writer about higher education, who, who was serving on a, a group, the AGB, the Association of Governing Boards. Uh, they, they had organized a committee to talk about improving board selection. And Richard said, mo mostly the committee was people from the world of business. They're, they're, they were the people who were worried about this. And he said, you know, I always wonder uh, wouldn't it be interesting if you had college professors serve on the boards of corporations? Because they're thoughtful men and women, and they've had a lot of experience in the world. They're, they're the source of the future leadership of, of businesses. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? And the answer, he said, of course, is we don't know anything about running a business. Huh. But so why do you business people think that because you're good at running businesses, you'd be good at running college? You don't know anything about colleges. You spend your time thinking about whatever business you're in. You don't spend your time thinking about colleges. We think about colleges all the time. And uh, I don't think the fiduciary obligations can be ignored. In fact, it's illegal to ignore them. And I don't think boards, in fact, do ignore them. But it's not about the money. So would that mean we should have more of those uh, honorific and thrill philanthropic boards and uh, fewer fiduciary seats? Oh, look, it makes perfect sense to have somebody who really understands how to do an audit successfully, somebody who understands the investment portfolio that needs to be managed, even if you have a small endowment. In some ways, a small endowment means you need to pay more effective attention to, to how well you're doing. So, no, I think, I think there are specific functions where it's absolutely important to have these people. But that doesn't mean you have to have a group like that as okay. the essential composition. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, and uh, Mark, thank you for the great question. Um, by the way, the book is full of these uh, observations that really just lay bare how colleges and universities work. You, you mentioned uh, endowments, um, uh, and those you know, your section on that is, is just really just so badly needed, I think. Uh, we have more questions that are just lining up. You know, Now the dam has burst and people are, are full of queries, which is what we love. Uh, and Mike Garn uh, from Georgia asks, with growing interest in lifelong learning, what is the likelihood we might see colleges experimenting with subscription models? So if what that means is, you know, can I sign up and take a class or can I have an online, you know, learning experience? Obviously, colleges are going to try. For one thing is that many colleges are looking for alternative sources of revenue. And it could be that some sort of a subscription service that people would sign up for and they would take some classes. Um, uh, Sure. I mean, that that probably makes sense. But is it going to be that we're going to stop having, you know, the sort of traditional model of you go to a certain college and you follow a path to getting a degree? You know, 
I really don't think that's what's going to happen. I think for a long time, people in the in the era of MOOCs are going to change the world. Um, it was, oh, maybe we're going to have pop bead higher education where you take a course here and a course there and whatever. And maybe we even have a third party that keeps track of the courses you've taken. And in the end, they'll add up to a total and you have a degree. But of course, that's not what education is. It's more than the sum of its parts. And so I mean, anybody who's who's on a college campus knows that they're not just thinking about, you know, the isolated courses. They're thinking about the experience that they give to their students. And they're thinking about if a student is seeking a certain credential, what are all the parts that have to fit together to accomplish that credential? So, you know, if that question is about is there something else that many colleges and universities could do to you know, provide through their expertise, this kind of experience for adults, sure. But does that transform higher education? I don't think that transforms higher education. Yeah, you know, the way I would look at this is that uh, I don't, I, I think it's very likely that, that colleges and universities, many colleges and universities will get more into the business of educating older adults. Uh, than they have uh, uh, historically. Uh, and I think that's partly because, at least in the, in the universe I hope for, people will have more time to think and study when they're older than they, than they have historically been able to do because people basically worked until they died, uh -huh. uh, if you go back 100 years. Uh, now, hopefully, people will live longer and will be able to space out their work alternating with other kinds of activities in their lives. That's a dream, I admit, in many ways. But the odds that the best place to go when you're 50 is the place you went when you were 20, not that okay. good, right? So huh. Huh. I don't think you, you should find individual colleges focused on educating their little group of, pe of people over their entire lives but instead that colleges should be available to people to draw on in their older lives. Now, maybe consortia of schools could collectively offer something like a subscription. Mm. But, you know, maybe you, you, you're 55 years old, you're doing fine in your work, but you've always had this hankering to learn to draw. Go to an art school, right? Learn to draw. Uh, don't think about whether Carnegie Mellon is the right place to go to learn to draw. Uh, maybe it is. Well, I know, but uh, but I think we have to be more flexible than that. Or a community college. Um, community college, absolutely. So maybe we'll see a consumer behavior along these lines, but we won't necessarily see institutional subscription models as a result. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, Mike, thank you for that great question. Um, and you can see, uh, friends, that we have more and more questions coming up. Uh, and there's uh, there's one from Miriam Wallace. Let me bring this one up on stage so everyone can see it. Uh, and uh, Miriam asks, I'm concerned about defunding public institutions along with public rhetoric saying higher ed isn't worth it. How do those of us at Publix articulate our value for external audiences? And Miriam's at the University of Illinois Springfield. You know, public public higher education, as people have sometimes said, uh, the the funding of public higher education by legislatures and governors is always at the end of the whip. Uh, when when there is a budget squeeze for the state budget as a whole. Uh, as there is generally in recessions, you take a look at the list of things you really can't cut. You, know, you, you can't cut uh, public safety. You can't cut public health, uh, even if some people think you can. Um, you can't cut elementary secondary school, which is actually what higher education has to fundamentally rest on. The one thing you feel like you can cut higher education. It's out there at the whip uh -huh. end. Uh, and you think you can cut it partly because the colleges can make up for it with higher tuition. 
And there's a kind of a nod and a wink in some cases that the legislature is saying, you go take care of your financial problems yourselves. We're, we're going to worry about other things. So I think that's a continuing threat that we see. And I do also agree that, that many politicians are dining out on uh, beating up on, on higher education. Definitely. doubts about its true value, either in purely economic terms or in ideological terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But man, the society we live in, fundamentally built around knowledge, invention, technological advance, uh, the idea that we can continue to build that without investing public money as well as private money in, in the preparation of our people to uh, think well, communicate well, the things you really get out of college. Let me just say that I think one of the real problems that <clears throat> is relevant to the, to the question is that many um, state legislators particularly, but lots of public figures, it's not so much that they're questioning the whole idea of college, it's that they're really questioning the idea of learning as opposed to occupational preparation. So you uh -huh. always hear, do we need more art historians? Do we need more anthropologists? Whatever. So I think one of the important tasks is to educate people about why it is that people need to learn broadly, why they need to become become educated and that the specific area they study is not really the issue. I mean, no matter what field you're talking about, the number of people whose careers end up being closely related to what they studied in college is smaller than anyone would think. And yeah. we need people to stop. I mean, what, what I would like to shut down is this idea that it's worthless if you're studying something that, you know, what if you're studying history? I mean, really, you want to say it doesn't matter if people don't have a historical perspective, even if they're not going to be historians when they grow up. So I think focusing our attention on that issue is really critical. What's the uh, what was that Reagan quote from when he was governor of California? It's not the responsibility of California taxpayers to subsidize intellectual curiosity, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the opponent. Um, uh, Miriam, thank you for that great question and good luck uh, at Illinois. And Mike and Cindy, thank you for those excellent, excellent answers. Um, we have more questions and I wanna make sure everyone gets a, a shot at these. And here comes one from a trustee at Amherst University. Um, and this question is, isn't Bomal's cost disease the key driver here? As productivity growth in delivering teaching and administrative services is almost nil, while pay needs to continue to rise to retain faculty, et cetera. That's John Williams. He's a trustee at Amherst. You know, it's it's something I've thought about because I am thinking about writing an essay about the history of the cost disease. And I think there's a sense in which that's fundamentally got to be true that uh, uh, healthcare, uh, live musical performance, live theatrical performance, uh, classroom teaching, these are all things where uh, productivity uh, has a great deal of difficulty in advancing. Uh, you know, uh, Will Baumol used to say that, that going to the going to a concert hall and listening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is going to take an hour and a half of the time of 90 people, no matter what you do with technology. You can make the sound better with better uh -huh. speakers. Uh -huh. and, and higher education has definitely a lot of those qualities, as does healthcare. Uh, but empirically, when you look at the data year by year and over time, you have to recognize that there are a lot of other things that are going on in addition to this cost disease. And it's not, and I, I'm sure uh, Dr. Williams, Mr. Williams doesn't mean to imply this, it's not the sole explanation. And it's not enough, I mean, it's, it's really important to get people to understand that, but it doesn't take us off the hook for trying to figure out how we can produce high quality, higher education um, without using quite so many resources. I mean, I think we have to stay in that, make that effort because the reality is it's really expensive and it's worth a lot, but we need to keep making that effort, even acknowledging that, no, uh, we're never going to be able to be, you know, sort of 
have tuition. You would you would want to oppose anything that says tuition can only rise at the general rate of inflation, because that's really a problem. But that, that, that's not the end of the story. Uh, I couldn't find the page offhand, but you, um, the two of you, have a good uh, a good discussion about this in the book where you talk about back office functions uh, and how those can be automated and those can be uh, made more productive uh, in, in various ways. Thank you both, uh, and thank you um, for the great question, um, Trustee Williams. Really appreciate that. We have a question which I can't flash on the screen because it happened in the chat and it happened in a real hurry. Um, but if I can summarize it, uh, several people, including our dear friend Lisa Durf, were talking about AI in education um, and uh, the possibility of both uh, students and faculty using AI to produce more and more of their work. And the final result of this exchange, let me make sure I get this right here, um, uh, they mentioned, for example, uh, uh, Sal Khan's uh, Conmigo, um, part of Khan Academy. Um, and then the question they have is, does if, if we have AI deployed at scale within higher education and being used by both faculty and students, does that reduce the value uh, and therefore the price of higher education? Lisa and, and everybody, please, if I've mangled that horribly, please, please correct me in the chat and I can amend. Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't want to make any predictions about what role AI is going to play. Uh, my instinct is to say that we're in a moment where everyone thinks everything is going to change dramatically. And my guess is that things are going to change, things are going to evolve, but it's not going to be the end of the world as we know it. Um, Obviously, we, you know, many people have thought about what are the concerns about people not creating their own work, both students and faculty. That's obviously a big concern. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, education is about people and it's about people interacting with people and learning together how to think and solve problems. And, um, you know, AI doesn't have a mind of its own in that sense. It's not going to replace uh, human beings. And I think we may face a lot of new challenges in making sure that we structure our institutions so that we really do promote creativity and individual thought and people working together. But um, we just have to face those challenges. It's not that this is going to take over hmm. education and make the people yeah. irrelevant. I, I really think that just misses the whole concept of, of a meaningful and high quality education. If I can reduce... Uh, with that point uh, to a slogan, uh, we may get more AI, but we're always going to need more I. Hmm. Hmm. Whether it's A or H, um, mm -hmm. artificial or humanoid. Um, well, Lisa et al., uh, thank you um, uh, for, uh, for forming that. And uh, Sandy, thank you for that very passionate defense, as well as uh, Michael, thank you for the uh, really useful slogan. Um, we have uh, a couple of more questions coming in, and here is one that sounds a little cryptic to my ear, but I might um, I might be missing this. I think, Sandy, this one is aimed for you, um, which is, what insights do you have from your experience at Skidmore? Uh, and this is a... Uh, okay, I guess that's for me. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I uh, taught at Skidmore, I mean, Mike taught at Williams and, and was president of McAllister. I mean, so the question is about, what about, you know, strong liberal arts colleges. I think that both of us have been really shaped by our liberal arts experiences. I mean, I went to Bryn Mawr. I just spent 10 years on the Bryn Mawr College Board. And so I have oh. a lot of liberal arts college experience. And I think that it makes me value all the more um, what people can do together and the communities that colleges can create. Of course, I'm also an economist studying this this industry. And so I'm very aware of what a small slice of higher education these colleges represent, but I think they are terrifically important. And I would love to have more students have, have more access to those experiences. I think they're, they're really important and, and they're worth a lot. And I feel very fortunate to have had that experience. Mm, excellent. Um, well, Jessica, thank you for the question. If you want to uh, add more to it, um, please, please feel free again with the Q and A box or, or with the chat. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, Dr. McPherson. You, you spoke about your interest in history, and for me, that always makes me want to turn that around to looking ahead a bit. 
Uh, I mean, as a futurist, I draw heavily on history for precedent, examples, uh, inspiration, and models. Um, um, if, if you could start off by, um, and, and of course, um, Dr. Baum, I, I would love to hear you as well on this. Where do you think the next decade of higher education financing goes? Um, what are some of the big contours of the next 10 years that we should be looking out for? I mean, for example, should we be anticipating a further decrease of state funding, both for universities and community colleges, at least on the per student basis? Do you think we're going to have a major attempt to legislate something about student debt? Um, will the demographic tide really keep cutting down that uh, trickle of incoming students? Hey, what does the next 10 years look like for you? Uh, I'm, I'll try to say something interesting, but let me first say something boring, which is <laughs> hardly. Uh, almost always things change less than you think they're going to. There is a tremendous amount of, of persistence in these institutions. You know, mm -hmm. with the exception of the Roman Catholic Church, in institutions of higher learning are the longest existing institutions in the Western world. They were founded in the 1200s, basically on a similar model to what they are now with rowdy young people coming into these privileged places and tearing up the town. I mean, it's, it's amazing if you go back and look at this, that it was they were faculty run institutions and they joined together to actually select their own presidents. Um, there's something about this organizational structure that really works and that has survived tremendous amounts of change, not without changing itself, but it really has a lot of persistence. Personally, I think over the next 10 years, uh, forgive me if this answer is too political. That's okay. Uh, we, uh, we are at some risk of uh, losing our democracy. And one thing we know about authoritarian regimes, and I don't want to go too far. I'm not predicting that there's going to be some revolution in the United States. But one thing we know about more authoritarian orientation is it is very incompatible with successful higher education because you can't afford to have free thought. And free thought is what nourishes higher education. So I hope this passes and we don't actually have that kind of loss of intellectual freedom but there are some threats out there and they yeah. they do worry me. I mean, I think obviously a lot of what happens in the next decade depends on, you know, like who's going to be our next president. I mean, all you have to do is look around at the different states in the country. And uh, I mean, Florida has been in the press more than others about changes in higher education. And you can see that things could change pretty dramatically, pretty quickly, depending on um, which way the government goes. But barring extreme outcomes, I mean, funding, state funding has been cyclical always, always. And, you know, you can look at graphs of what has happened to funding per student and what has happened to tuition prices. And it's always just you see years and years and years of things going in, in opposite ways. And those sorts of things are going to continue to happen. State funding has picked up again and pretty much, you know, caught up and, uh, it, it, do I think that we're going to suddenly say, oh, let's put a much larger share of our state budgets into higher education? No. But are we going to stop funding it in a reasonable way? No, because I think that in fundamentally state legislators know how dependent they are on higher education for their workforce, even if they don't appreciate education per se, they do hmm. appreciate having having a trained workforce. And so, again, I think... Um, you know, and I feel like, you know, I'm old enough to have listened to this conversation um, over and over about this is the end. We can't possibly have this financing model any longer. It's going to crash. It hasn't crashed yet. That doesn't mean it never will. But I think things are going to evolve. I think there are things that we can't predict now. And I think there are going to be important changes. 
But I really think, you know, some colleges will go out of business, but they won't, you know, just, you know, what was a decade ago that people were saying a large share of colleges are going to cease to exist in the next decade. Well, they haven't. Some colleges will go under because they won't be able to make it. But that's always true. Um, that happens to businesses all the time. And we don't say, oh, we well, don't have a viable model of, of businesses. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a futurist and I'm not going to make big predictions, but I think it's really easy to go overboard with thinking that we are at a drum, on a dramatic precipice. Well, this is, this is very, very useful. I, I appreciate your, your uh, if, if the social science paper generator model always begins, includes the phrase continuity and change. Um, I mean, you've, you've, you've hit the continuity elements really, really hard. And that's, and that's important. Um, I do want to ask about one, one possible aspect of change. Uh, Cindy, you were talking about, um, uh, you know, changes in the business model or the business model uh, being durable. In the book, you sketch out very clearly that uh, the discount rates have been rising uh, more and more steeply. And just again, friends, if, if you haven't encountered the phrase before, uh, this is the amount by which a university discounts its published tuition uh, price. So a discount rate of 50% means that if the tuition published is 50,000, it means the median person actually pays 25,000. How much how much further can the tuition discounting go? I mean, Nakubo has it below 50 or I'm sorry, higher than 55 percent for a lot of private universities and uh, publics are closing it behind that. Uh, does that just keep escalating in line with uh, overall macroeconomic trends of increasing wealth and economic inequality? Well, um, I mean, one thing is that as tuition rises, the discount rate is going to rise because you have to keep if you want people to be able to afford it, the percentage changes in the aid you give them are going to be greater than the percentage changes in the tuition. Obviously, you're not going to get to 100%. I mean, you can't draw a straight line up because then there would be no revenue. Um, and I think that there's, again, these averages are hard to look at because there's so much um, difference across mm -hmm. institutions. Um, right. So, you know, I think probably it has to slow down. But when people say, why don't we stop and just stop discounting and get back to what is the real tuition? We aren't going to do that because you're not going to charge everybody the same price because you would be cutting out all those students who can't afford it. Will there be more schools that do this thing of we're cutting our tuition by, you know, 20 percent and then we're going to give less financial aid? Potentially there will be. Um, but in terms of a dramatic change is, is the model of discounting and charging different students different prices, is that going to go away? No, I don't think it's viable for that to go away. Mm. Maybe there will be fewer institutions giving 100% of their students a discount. Mm. I don't know. But uh, I, again, I think it's the kind of thing that we have to monitor. And it's obviously not going to keep going up, 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 up. People used to predict like student debt was just going to go straight up, 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 up forever. And of course it didn't, it started going down, down, down. Nobody really noticed that, but it did. So, um, you know, um, it, this is probably gonna go on for a while and the discount rate is gonna be high, but it might not rise at the same rate. Well, that's interesting. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. That especially makes sense with uh, uh, continued rise of, uh, of tuition. I have so many more questions to ask, and I think people would like to chime in with still more, and we are at the end of the hour. Um, you two have taken us through a whirlwind tour of campus finances. Um, what's the best way to keep up with the two of you and your new work? I mean, you know, um, uh, Michael, if we want to find uh, uh, these these historical essays that you're starting to work on, and Sandy, if we want to find, uh, you know, your thoughts about these major issues rolling higher education, how, how can we keep up with you two? Well, I have a website, sandybaum.com, which I try to keep up. And I do write um, yeah. blogs on the Urban Institute website. But you should yeah. feel free to share our email addresses with people. And anybody who has questions should feel free mm. to, to contact us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm happy to do that. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to offload the work of contacting you to other people um but i but but more seriously i'm i'm absolutely delighted that you've taken an hour to share your thoughts with us um and that you took much more than an hour to write a, a really really excellent book uh, thank you for all of your work i'm looking forward to seeing uh what you produce next um and uh, all best during this extremely extremely hot summer um well thank you very much for the opportunity thank you. oh our pleasure our pleasure
But don't go away, friends. Let me just point out where we're headed over the next few weeks. If you'd like to keep talking about this, if you'd like to keep wondering about everything from discount rates to debt to Bomal's cost disease and overall college finance, um, please, there are multiple venues for you to do that. Uh, on Twitter or on Mastodon, just use the hashtag FTTE. You can see my accounts there and both of those, or of course, on my blog. And if you would like to look into our previous sessions where we've talked about campus finances, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and you can find a whole series of sessions on that. Looking ahead, we have a bunch of forum events coming up, including several on AI plus in campus organizing. So if you just go to our forum website, you can find more about that. Uh, and of course, the last time I'll say this, please subscribe to my Substack about AI and the future of higher education. I would love to hear your thoughts there. Uh, thank you all for such great questions and such great commentary today. I really appreciate it. You helped make this a really, really powerful session. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, I know I've had a, a pretty difficult past month, and I really appreciate all of your support. Thank you for all of that. I hope all of you managed to stay cool where it is hot, and above all, I hope all of you managed to stay safe. Take care, everyone. Be well, and see you next time online. Bye-bye.